Um, so this session is about bottleneck analysis, and I'm going to run you through the full stack of analyzing everything from the browser all the way down to uh, the nitty-gritty of the server, just to give you kind of a full, quick overview of you know how you can identify performance and scalability issues within the application. Um, so before we get going, uh, a few quick words about myself. So I'm a longtime contributor to the PHP project, so I helped uh, develop a number of extensions, worked on core and a variety of other things. Um, and as part of that, I've actually worked on a performance aspect of PHP as well. So some of the things you see here actually came from having to work on optimizing both PHP and the applications written in PHP. So um, the first thing, I guess, what, what's causing bottlenecks and what's why bottlenecks are a problem? So bottlenecks are not a performance problem, as many people like to uh, put. There's actually a mix of both a scalability and a performance problem. Because if you had a, something that was a purely a speed issue or something was not as quick, um, you know, one of the easy solutions to do it is throw hardware at the problem. And as much as people would tell you that that's the wrong approach, uh, trust me, it works. And it works really, really well. You get faster disk, you throw more memory, all of a sudden your database is able to fly. Scalability problems, on the other hand, you can't solve with hardware because it means that the code cannot expand, cannot uh, you know, grow to a point that even if you throw hardware at it, you're just buying yourself a very short amount of time um, before the problem scales up to a point where even the extra hardware is not going to be able to help you. So that's a very important uh, point to keep in mind. So let's take a look at a typical web process. And you really got to think of the entire stack if you're really thinking about scalability. Um, so first of all, you have your users or clients using their web browser. And before uh, the request hits your web server, you got to think about things like DNS, latency, page sizes because of the network speed, number of components to the page. So that's the number of JavaScript and CSS files that you have that are being transmitted. Uh, as well as the complexity of the extra things like JavaScript and CSS. And JavaScript nowadays in particular, because most browsers, for performance reasons, actually compile JavaScript to effectively native code, whether it's Chrome, IE, Firefox, it doesn't really matter. And those things can have an impact on the speed and ultimately the scalability of the application. Now, when it hits the web server, you still have other things like SSL negotiation, page caching, uh, compression overhead, which is one of the things that you have to think about if you have big resources, as well as pre-processing of requests. How many people here have used Apache with HD access and mod rewrite? Okay. <laughs> so you, you probably know at this point that if you do non-trivial mod rewrite rules, they can actually take quite a bit of time to process. In fact, it's not uncommon that a simple PHP request, let alone a static file, will actually be processed faster than it takes to mod rewrite to figure out how to do the remapping of the URLs and so on that you have. So that's definitely one of the things to keep in mind. Now, when you get to the scripting language itself, I mean, you have the obvious things. You have slow code. So slow code needs to be optimized in some way. Uh, you may have lock contention. So if you're writing things to disk or you're writing things to things uh, like databases in some cases or caching system, you may have to deal with things where you, know, you have multiple writers trying to write to the same block of data simultaneously. And subsequently, one has to wait for the other to complete before um, you can have an issue. And when it comes to PHP, you also have something called non-critical errors. So those are the warnings and notices, the strikes, and all that wonderful stuff that you'd think well, how can it have an impact on performance and scalability? Well, I'll show you some uh, benchmarks down the line to, to show you just how big of an impact simple errors can have within the application. Then you get to the things like the caching layer so you know, and database. So you have lock contentions, uh, data storage, um, lack of indexes, and all of the other uh, interesting things that anytime you deal with databases, you have to be aware of. So the bottom line is that there's a lot of different sources with bottlenecks. So let's start from the very beginning, which is the browser. Now, the reason I want to start with the browser, because this is a very common mistake. So a developer would complete an application. They want to test or convince uh, you know, their boss or whoever that the application is quick. They fire up Apache Bench, just because it's pretty much on any Unix machine. They hit the request with a number of URLs. They see the number at the bottom. Oh, wow, almost 2,100 requests per second. You know, we don't have a, any issues here. We can deploy this into production. The challenge what it doesn't consider is that 
most users don't use Apache Bench to browse the web. They actually use their web browser, as strange as it may be. And the web browser needs to parse the HTML, needs to load the JavaScript, load CSS, load all the images, do a whole bunch of pre-processing, and only then does a user see the final outcome, which is your page. So even though it's your server, it looks like this is a really quick piece of content. To the user, uh, it may seem really slow. And when it comes to web uh, serving, it's the user perception that sometimes matters more than the actual speed of the server. That's why Apple, in particular, they focused on the user perception. And it looks like if you have an Apple computer, it wakes up from sleep really quickly. Well, it doesn't. It just shows you fake images of a screenshot taken right before it went to sleep. But it can load it really quickly. So it seems to you like there's something on the screen, something you can interact with um, you know, very quickly. So the same thing applies to web experience as well. Now, in order to understand the user's web experience, you need to profile how the browser is interpreting that page. Now, there's a variety of tools that you can use for this. Personally, I prefer to use Chrome. It has a really good um, analyzer of requests built right into it. It's called Developer Tools. But if you're using Safari or Firefox, uh, Firefox is Firebug and Safari. It's also a built-in tool. They all nowadays have uh, similar tools like this. So I decided to pick on PHP.NET. This is actually the previous design of PHP.NET. So now I can safely poke fun at PHP.NET because that's been fixed to some extent. So this is a portion of the profile of PHP.NET. So if we look at the very first portion here, which is that blue bar at the top, um, this is what it takes to load the main site. What is interesting here, and I know those of you in the back probably can see it, um, is it says that it took 206 milliseconds just to establish the connection to PHP.NET. So a fifth of a second effectively was wasted without any positive outcome because nothing happened in this particular case. Then it took another um, 200 milliseconds for the web server to say, okay, I got your request, I got to do some thinking, and then once I'm done thinking, I'll start sending you the data. So we're already close to being half a second mark. And then, last but not least, I happened to be at another conference, so the internet connection was really slow when I made those slides. It took 1.2 seconds to actually download the content of PHP.NET. So even though the server potentially only took a fifth of a second to provide me with the content, uh, from a user perception, it actually took two seconds to load just the HTML of the page. And I'm not even talking about all the static content like JavaScript, CSS, and so on. So this is a perfect example of you know, perception driving the user's uh, experience in terms of the application. So let's take a look at a couple of other things on PHP.NET. So PHP.NET loads a bunch of images. Um, that's pretty normal. But it actually takes 162 uh, milliseconds uh, to wait to transmit that image. So why does the web server need to think that long before transmitting a static file, which would be pretty instant? Well, this is where things like mod rewrite rule or HG access rules come in. Because even though the web server technically is not doing anything, there is a whole bunch of pre-processing that needs to happen to transmit that file. Or maybe you have really, really slow disks. You're serving things off CF cards or something in your server, in which case <laughs> this could, in fact, be a valid possibility. So. Um, a couple of other things uh, that are worth noting. This is actually Facebook, another popular site, perhaps a little bit more popular than PHP.net. <laughs> so um, I actually broke down this into three steps, which actually are shown uh, by these lines. So the first thing you can see is that it took a roughly 413 uh, milliseconds to finish transmitting the content. Eh, that's not particularly bad. That's not particularly good average. It's under a second, which is what people like to see. However. It took another uh, 400 milliseconds to actually finish transmitting all of the relevant data, and another 400 milliseconds to actually have the page fully load for the user. So even though your back end was pretty quick, from, the user did not actually see the page as quickly as you thought it, it might show up. It basically took three times longer than it took for just the back end to do all the other processing. So let's pick on uh, Facebook uh, a little bit more. Um, so one of the things that Facebook does is to optimize some of the loading. They actually load content from different subdomains. Now, the challenge with using different subdomains is that every single time you load something, it needs to do a DNS lookup. Now, some people have fast DNS servers. Some people not so much. So what you can see here is that 
the first DNS request took an extra 20 milliseconds. That's pretty inconsequential. We can ignore it. But another DNS request took 106 milliseconds because for whatever uh, it is, possibly using a CDN, so it wasn't a subdomain of Facebook, it may have been a completely different domain, it had to resolve it completely from scratch. So people who are using uh, domain and subdomain tricks to load a JavaScript asynchronously or other things, they may be solving one problem that now you can load JavaScript in parallel, but creating another because those DNS lookups, especially on a first page load, um, are not end up being you know, a lot slower than you'd like. Now you may say, well, DNS lookup, it happens once and after that it's, it's cached. That is true. However, um, if you're dealing with a site where a lot of the traffic is not repeat users, like it, it's in the case of Facebook where people just come back over and over again, but it is something where you're driving traffic from Google AdWords or from other form of advertising, it's been said that if a page takes more than a second and a half to load, you have a substantial number of visitors starting to drop off the site. So you're losing traffic that you're now trying to drive to the application. So the DNS loads do add up, and you want to be really careful around how many domains or subdomains you're using to process this. Now here's another site. In this case, I decided to hide domain because this is pretty bad. Uh, this particular site loads a ton of JavaScript. There's literally a, almost a full page of different JavaScript files being loaded. Now, the JavaScript files are actually pretty small. Most of them are only a you know, few hundred bytes in size. But because JavaScript is loaded uh, sequentially, not asynchronously, you'll see that most of the requests are sitting in blocking. So you end up, by the end of this, waiting th almost four seconds, waiting for all the previous JavaScript files to finish loading. So from a user experience, once again, not a particularly good thing that you want to see have happen. So uh, this is PayPal, another company I like to pick on. Um, so PayPal uh, uses SSL, which is great. Um, the one thing to note is that in the case of uh, PayPal, their SSL takes almost half a second to load. And when you're using SSL, when you're using multiple subdomains, guess what? For every single subdomain, there has to be a separate SSL negotiation. So once you start doing this, those things start to add up because this was a first request, this was a second, another 190 milliseconds. So it gets slower and slower and slower. And I haven't done the full analysis just to give you a brief sample of what can be uh, found. The other thing, and this um, is a little bit contextual perhaps to North America, so maybe you guys will correct me if uh, the situation is different in Europe or in Germany in particular. In North America, the internet connectivity of a typical house is that you can download things really, really quickly. But if you need to send data back to the server, that is usually five to ten times slower. Now, a lot of web developers forget that, and they start creating a ton of cookies. One of the um, common culprits to it, if you use a lot of the grid controls and things like jQuery um, and Dojo.js and so on, uh, there's this really convenient feature that says that every time you sort a grid, it's going to set a cookie and remember your sorting preferences, so you can do that next time. Now, what it doesn't mention, that for every single grid, it's going to create a new cookie. So what ends up being is that now, every time a user is requesting any piece of content from your domain, whether it's a static file or dynamic file, it's going to send all of those cookies, which could end up being hundreds of kilobytes. Now, if you happen to be in North America and using a typical you know, home connection, I'm not saying dial-up, but even a high-speed connection, this can actually substantially slow down the request um, serving process because on every um, retrieval, the browser needs to send you know, maybe two or three or four kilobytes of cookies to the server. And surprisingly enough, it does add up, and it could mean that the page is going to take an extra couple of seconds to load uh, before it can be rendered to the user. Now, all of these things are great, um, and it's wonderful. But one of the things is that using all of those extensions, where are you doing your testing? Well, you're doing a testing on your local machine, which means you probably are local to the application server. You don't really have a true expression of the network overhead. Um, how can you test the experience of multiple different users and different browsers and all of those wonderful problems? So this is where uh, this interesting tool comes in called Boomerang. And Boomerang is actually something that was, came up by uh, a guy by the name of uh, Philip Tellis. And this is a URL where you can grab it from GitHub. And what Boomerang does is it's a JavaScript tool that you can embed in, into your application. And when a request is being loaded or finished being loaded by the server, it's going to transmit 
the data back to your server saying, here's what was the user's perception in terms of how long it took for all the files to load, how long it took for the page to actually finish rendering, and all of those wonderful statistics. And in order to integrate it into your application, all you need to do is load boomerang.js and then uh, initialize a beacon URL, which is usually recommended to be a transparent pixel or just like a one pixel image. And it's a static request, so your server is going to make a request for this pixel.gif uh, dynamically. Um, and via the URL, it's going to indicate all of the timing statistics. So you end up this really, really long URL with a ton of different parameters inside that particular uh, URL that are going to be shown. And then all of that information can be retrieved from your uh, Apache or Nginx or Lighty, whatever uh, HTTP server you happen to be using. And the reason it does it via URL is so that you don't need to deploy any additional logging or tracking tools. Because this type of analysis you don't need to do in real time. And you can download or archive your web server logs and then simply uh, extract all the requests for pixel.gif or what you end up calling the file. And then parsing the URL for all the statistical information that boomerang.js has captured. So on a more basic iteration, it will tell you the version of Boomerang. Uh, it will tell you how long it took to retrieve the page and what was the URL that was requested in a URL encoded form if you happen to have any URL parameters as part of the URL. Now, what Boomerang uses in the background is something called W3C Navigation Timing API. And it's supported by pretty much all the modern browsers. And what it does is it actually uses the browser's internal timing statistics to give you a really, really detailed breakdown of the request serving process. So you can literally find out how long it took to load a particular JavaScript file or a particular image or uh, basically any piece of information. Just to give you a, an idea, this is all of the information that W3C navigation timing is able to capture. It can even tell you how long it took for the previous page to be unloaded and basically freed up from memory. Um, and you can see DNS resolution, TCP IP negotiation, request, response, processing, unload, and so on. So effectively, all of the same statistics that you can see in the web developer tools, now you can see from the perception of your users um, basically for every single request with virtually no overhead because the extent of your overhead is loading boomerang.js, which, believe you me, is not a particularly large JavaScript file, so it's not going to slow things down. Now, from all this data, there's really four key points that you want to focus on. Start of user experience, because you can't really count how long it took to free up memory from a previous request. Um, when uh, did the server begin processing the request that came in? So this is where things finally got to more or less your control. Uh, when was the page loaded? So this is where all the content has been loaded. And finally, you can find out when all the post events uh, have finished firing. So when you have the JavaScript code that says on document ready and so on, this is when all those events finished uh, their work. This is where you're going to get the final timing. So you really get a full breakdown of the request. Just to give you an idea how much data you have access to, this in very, very small font I know, um, is the listing of all the parameters. Most of them are timings in milliseconds that you can see here that are available for every single request if the browser supports the uh, W3C API for tracking it. Now, if you don't want to use Boomerang, I don't know why, but if you don't want to, you can actually implement a very simple variant of Boomerang on your own using just a few lines of JavaScript. So you initialize a timer uh, once the script loaded, so you really want this to be the very first uh, script inside your head block. And then you set up an onload function that is going to create a new image tag with the same pixel.gif. And it's going to say page load, which is you know, a new time less the original timing, and then the URL that was taken. And this is a kind of a poor man's boomerang, which is only going to give you the timing of how long it took for the page to uh, effectively render for the most part, because you're starting the uh, data tracking already after the page has finished requesting. So just a simple variant. And if you want to analyze the data, here's a little aux script. Uh, that will parse your you know, web server log file, extract the appropriate entries, and give you kind of a summary of how quick or how slow various requests have happened. So this is kind of a quick run through to the web server. Um, so let's talk about the web server bottlenecks. Now, when talking about web server bottlenecks, um, you can use Apache Bench. It's sufficiently sufficient for that purpose. I know some people prefer to use Siege. Uh, 
um, which is a little bit more sophisticated. There's a couple of other tools that you can use, but you know, for the most purposes, Apache Bench is, to be honest with you, is good enough. Now, one key thing is that a lot of people forget when they're using Apache Bench is paying attention to the failed requests. Because what sometimes happens is that Apache Bench, by default, has actually a set amount of time that it's going to wait for the server to respond. And if the server does not respond because maybe there's no available processes to do so, um, it will simply mark the request as failed. So sometimes you can see an artificially quick uh, communication between the server and Apache Bench, but it's because your failed requests are basically through the roof. So make sure that this number is zero, because any value other than zero indicates that something is not going according to plan. Um, the other thing you want to focus on is another, this is a kind of a copy of a table from one of the outputs of Apache Bench, is the processing and the waiting times. Because waiting times means that this is how long something is waiting to be executed versus processing is the actual execution. So ideally, you want those to be pretty close to being the same, but definitely something to uh, keep an eye out. The last bit of Apache Bench output is a breakdown of percentage of requests that are served within a certain time. So in this particular example, you could see that 90% of the requests have been served in uh, basically a quarter of a second, which may be within your target. And only the remaining 5% took longer. Now, the reason this grid is important is because when you get the initial set of output from Apache Bench, uh, it gives you the averages. And the averages could be skewed by the fact that when the server was not doing anything, the first couple of hundred requests got processed really, really quickly. But then after those requests were processed, the server started to get slow because of lock contention and all the other things. And the remaining 50% uh, were very, very slow as a result. And the average may still look OK, but it doesn't mean you don't have a problem. So you really are looking for situations where whatever your target happens to be, between 80 and 90% are served within that target. And then the remaining 10% or 5%, whatever the number happens to be, are slower, but that's because maybe they hit where, I don't know, the you know, computer was loading stuff into cache or offloading stuff into cache, or maybe there was something unrelated to your application happening in a machine, and that caused some temporary slowdown. Now, when you're testing your web server for bottleneck, there is a number of basic tests that you want to conduct before actually running your application to see if you can identify a variety of web server type of issues that you can have within your server. So the first thing you want to do is you want to create a static file. It doesn't matter whether it's a JavaScript or HTML or CSS, but basically a static file, about 10 kilobytes in size. So it really shouldn't you know, cause any issues on its own. And um, you want to request that file. The first thing you want to watch for is the res response size the same as the file size. If the answer is yes, that means you're not using compression. And then the question is, why are you not using compression? In most cases, um, nowadays, a web server will be able to do compression at virtually nominal overhead. And the saving of sending smaller content to the user um, is far better from a user experience than the little overhead uh, that the web server is going to do for compression. In most cases, compression is so quick that it is statistically insignificant. You actually have to really have big files in order to be able to detect the overhead caused by compression. Now, the other thing you want to watch for is, does the um, number request max out uh, bec before the network does. The reality is that any modern web server should be able to max out the network before you hit the no maximum number of requests. And just to give you an example, Mac Mini, not you know, to be confused with you know, a really powerful server, but a Mac Mini has a one gigabit port. For static files, Mac Mini using almost no matter which web server you use, whether it's Apache, Nginx, Lite HTTPD, um, I don't know anybody who installed IIS, so <laughs> I guess I shouldn't say anything about that. But um, any one of those web servers will saturate the network before the processor or the server itself is saturated. So you want to make sure the same thing happens on your machine. If it doesn't, then that means that you have some sort of uh, a server overhead. Maybe you have some complex routing rules using mod rewrite, or uh, maybe there's something else that you're doing on a server uh, which is interfering with static content serving. Because whatever the, what's, is slowing down static content is also going to slow down dynamic content. It's just on static content, you have less variables, so it's a lot easier to detect and ultimately resolve. Now, the other thing you want to check is, are there any fluctuations with connection times? 
Again, because static content is dead simple. And one of the things that you'll see is that if you keep requesting the same piece of static content, Linux in particular will say, hey, you're requesting this file very frequently. How about I put this file into memory so I don't actually have to read it from disk next time you request the file? So after the initial cache warm-up, you actually should have basically virtually no fluctuation in the speed that it takes the file to be served, and it should be pretty consistent. Once again, if you're seeing a fluctuation, that means that there is some sort of processing going on, and that processing is causing that extra bit of overhead that sometimes make it slow, sometimes fast, sometimes you know, neither slow or fast, sort of this average speed in between. The other thing you want to keep an eye out is, are there any spikes in your disk I.O. while uh, you're serving this content? Now, there's really only one reason why that could be the case, maybe two. One is maybe you disabled uh, or didn't give enough memory for the operating system to cache content on disk or it's full of other things. Let's say you're running a web server and a database server on the same machine, and the database server, because of the usage pattern, already had eaten up all the, you know, the cache memory that the kernel had allocated to do the caching. Uh, the other possibility is could be is that you have a lot of uh, write operations. This is actually common when you have a shared environment. So whether it's a um, you know virtual private server or whether you have a lot of VMs running on the same machine, there may be something else that's chewing up disk. And for the most part, uh, you know the old saying that the hard disk is the slowest part of the server is still true. Even if you're using SSDs. Um, they're still a lot slower than RAM or anything else. You really have to go to PCI Express-based cards to start getting to a point where uh, your disk may not be the slowest part of your machine. Another thing you want to take a look at is your uh, network I.O. And uh, this is one of the things that uh, we talked about, so maxing out um, the request size. And you should be able to max it out even if you enable uh, compression. You really want to make sure that that's uh, something that's, that's going to happen. Now, the other thing you want to do is that um, you know, do the requests per second max out before whatever your desired goal. And your desired goal is going to be set roughly based on when is your network going to max out. And for this, you typically will need a slightly bigger file. And what I mean by that is you want to determine what is your typical page request size. Uh, nowadays, it's not uncommon for a website's HTML, just the HTML to be about 80 kilobytes in size. This is before compression. And when you're talking about JavaScript files, when you get to jQuery and all those big uh, extensions, they can also get into that range, sometimes even exceeding 100 kilobytes. Now, this is where things get interesting, because uh, when you're serving large files, your web server does not actually serve the file entirely to the kernel, who is ultimately responsible for transmitting the file to the user. It actually works in blocks, and those blocks are called buffers. And the buffers, uh, if they are significantly smaller than the page size, and what actually happens is that the web server passes a buffer to the kernel. The kernel says, OK, great. Uh, hold on, I'm going to send this buffer to the user. Once the user receives that buffer, the kernel says, OK, give me the next buffer. So if you have big pages, uh, certainly above 50 kilobytes, you need to take a look at the kernel buffer settings that you have and probably increase them so that the entire page can fit in a kernel buffer so that the web server can say, here's the content that goes to, your, uh, to the user. The kernel says, OK, great, I'll take it. And then the web server is free to handle the next request. And then it's entirely in the hands of the kernel to serve the request to the user, in which case you don't need as many Ap Ap Apache or whatever processes that you're using to serve the content, which can, in many cases, substantially reduce the load on the server. Now, the other thing you want to measure on a server, and now we're getting to a little bit of PHP stuff, is take your static file, give it a .php extension, and see what happens. Now, Suffice to say, it's going to become a lot slower, because even though you're not running any PHP code, the PHP interpreter needs to be fired up. It needs to do some processing, and that has an overhead. But if you see that there is more than two times speed difference, so if you're able to do 100 requests per second uh, you know, before adding the PHP extension, now drop to 30, chances are you're not using an opcode cache. Because it, the overhead of adding PHP interpreter should not be more than two. If it is more than two, then opcode cache is probably what's missing. Or the opcode cache you have is badly misconfigured, and it's not actually doing anything. Maybe it's turned off. Um, the other thing is that if the opcode cache does not help, consider a different SAPI. So if you're still one of those people using CGI, and I don't mean fast CGI, but CGI, the original CGI, 
uh, switch to fast CGI or you know some other uh, API to serve PHP because that's not really doing a service for your web serving process. Now the next overhead you want to take a look at the server is the SSL overhead. So if you're seeing more than 100 milliseconds uh, difference, and you will have an overhead because SSL requires negotiation back and forth, it's not free, then one of the things you want to do on a server is enable things like SSL cache, um, can, uh, consider enabling TCP IP congestion settings in the kernel because uh, SSL negotiation requires a lot of back and forth between the server and the client. And that's not something that the kernel is particularly keen on. It's, it's thinking more along the lines of I'm going to send data and I'm going to get data back and that's going to be the end of it. So for uh, there are some settings that would allow you to fine tune the TCP IP settings for that particular purpose. Last but not least is GeoAware request routing. So if your users are, let's say, in North America and your server happens to be in Germany, there's going to be, because of a lot of that back and forth, there's going to be a lot of overhead to doing SSL. So you really are better off putting in a server that's uh, local to, or as local as it can be to your users so that back and forth communication does not suffer from latency of doing a transatlantic uh, data transfer, which is what you're doing every time you're doing SSL in that particular case. One of the things to mention with SSL, now that I'm talking about it, is if you happen to buy your SSL certificate from some of the um, SSL vendors, and those SSL vendors happen to be in a different uh, geographic region than what you are, they may be using something called a chain certificate, which means you have to load their certificate in addition to your own in order for your certificate to validate. And a lot of the smaller or even some of the medium-sized vendors don't consider the fact that all their users may not be in the same country as where the SSL vendor is. So even, your, even though your SSL certificate may be local, the chain certificate may be in a completely different part of the world. So that's definitely one of the things to take a look at. A little bit different from um, web store overheads, but certainly something to consider. Um, compression overhead. So compression overhead really should not cause a problem in most cases. The only thing you want to confirm is the compression doesn't add more than 10 to 20 milliseconds to the speed of the request. So it's pretty insignificant uh, load. If you're seeing more, one of the things that could cause a problem is most um, compression implementations like Mod Gzip and Apache, for example, allow you to comp uh, to set the compression level, and it usually goes from one to nine, where one means it's a most minimal level of compression, nine is a maximum level of compression. The reality is that in most cases, the file size is not going to be very different. But nine a level, which is a maximum level of compression, can take, in some cases, up to twice as long to actually do the compression for next to no result. So you actually want to set the compression level to one, two at the very maximum, because after that, the value you're getting from the extra processing of having to do more elaborate compression really doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, so now we get to actual PHP. So there's uh, a number of different ways to profile PHP. One of the tools that I strongly recommend is something called XHProf. Um, how many people have heard of XHProf? OK, so a lot of you have. How many have used XHProf? OK, a slightly fewer hands. So XHProf is basically it's a very lightweight profiler, originally designed by folks at Facebook. Um, and the whole goal of this profiler is to minimize the overhead and actually be able to do profiling in a production environment. You're not necessarily going to profile every single application uh, instance because you don't want to slow down every single user, but you can turn it on on a few application servers with a relatively minimal overhead. And the beauty of XHProf, unlike tools like um, Xdebug, for example, that also includes uh, Profiler, is it's able to aggregate a multitude of requests into a single report. So you're not basing your profile on a single request, which could be affected by a variety of different things happening on a server, but you can actually do the profiling on the basis of any number of requests actually coming out of production or test environment. Now, XHProf comes in two pieces. So you have the PHP extension, which is what, something you can get from Peckle. And you also have the visualizer, which you can grab from uh, another person, Paul Reinheimer, on uh, GitHub, which actually gives you a nice thing which will draw graphs and uh, allow you to more easily be able to interpret the information. So to start the profiling is actually quite simple. And that may show you one of the tricks that are possible in PHP. 
So in PHP, you have this setting called auto prepend file. And what it does is without modifying a single line of your PHP code, it allows you to effectively do the same thing as include, but inside every single file. So into this include, I loaded this code, which is load all the configuration and all the elements uh, coming from xhprof, and then tell me profile the CPU and memory usage, and then enable the profiler. And then at the end, I have another file being loaded via auto append file, which is going to do an include at the end of the file. And that is going to disable the profiler, because you don't want to profile the profiler. Um, it's going to aggregate the data and then save the data. And by default, it saves in a MySQL database. So nowadays, you can save it in SQLite or even MongoDB are the possible backend where the data can be stored. So literally, without modifying a single line of your PHP application, because changing code tends to break it, um, you're able to introduce Profiler into the application. And when you don't need it anymore, you just comment out these two directives, and you're done. So uh, very, very easy to uh, enable and use this mechanism. Now, XHProf has a variety of outputs. This is basically a general summary screen. Um, it's going to give you some information, like, for example, how many times a particular URL was executed. So you can actually see the historical profile of what's going on. Uh, it's going to give you the memory utilization, which is uh, you know, a fairly important metric when it comes to PHP performance and scalability, because there's only so much RAM available in your server, um, although nowadays you can still, still stick a couple of hundred uh, gigabytes, but it can be exhausted very easily if a typical request takes almost 200 megs of memory to execute. Um, it gives you a breakdown of execution time, um, also minimal, maximum parameters, and it actually can go as far as showing you the CPU time. And the reason it gives you the breakdown of the two is because the execution time is the total time it took to execute the request. The CPU time is how much time the actual CPU was spending to execute the request. So the big difference between the two means you may be doing things like waiting on a lock or waiting for a database query to return you data. So it takes longer for your request to execute, but the actual application server is not doing any real work. It's waiting for somebody to complete whatever it is they happen to be doing. Now, one of the nice things about Xdebug, which is why uh, uh, you know, people in management like it, it can draw pretty graphs. And, but those graphs can be quite useful. So this is actually a profile of the profiler. So which part takes the most memory? Well, it's our friend MySQL taking uh, 2.5 million uh, milliseconds to execute something within the page. Um, so and it basically visually identifies really quickly what are the parts of the application you want to focus on. Now, that is not to say you don't have you know, the detailed per call statistics that you normally are used to uh, see from a profiler where it tells you how long each individual function took to execute and so on. But one of the really big payoffs, um, especially if you have continuous integration or continuous code deployments that is possible with XHProf is the historical analysis. So this is one of the graphs that it generates. So you can see, OK, we had a suboptimal application and made it faster. Then somebody decided to add some extra optimizations. Things didn't quite go according to plan. And then those optimizations were reverted, and we're back to our optimal state, which was achieved after the initial load. And you have three lines, which tells you memory utilization, CPU usage, and the overall request load time. So pretty much everything you need to be able to see and track the performance of your application over time. Now, one of the other uh, really neat things that um, XHProf is able to do is if you install the call graph utility, it's also able to generate your call graphs, which in visual terms allow you to see the flow of the application to the slowest portion, which is conveniently marked in red, and the yellow path, which is basically how the application got to the slowest portion of the request. So once again, it's trying to make things visual to make it as easy as possible to identify where are the bottlenecks are within the application. Now, um, one of the problems with profiling, especially in a production environment, is profiling itself can be a bottleneck. And as fast as XHProf may be, uh, the moment you enable it, a request that took, let's say, a second to execute could easily now take two seconds to execute, or maybe even two and a half. If you're using things like Xdebug or some of the other profilers, this can be a factor of five or six compared to the original request time. 
So there are a couple of things that you can do to minimize the overhead of the profiler, which do not involve optimizing the profiler itself. That's a moot point. Um, and that is you can do statistical sampling. So if you have multiple application servers, enable the profiler on 10% of them, so you're not affecting the overall traffic. Uh, and only those servers are going to do the profiling. The other thing you can do is you can pre-identify targets. So you can use data from things like Boomerang, which tells you which pages take the longest to load, focusing on the time it took to serve the HTML content, which I was showing before, and say only when it's this particular page, only then enable the profiler, because you want to figure out what's going on in those cases. All other requests, which right now are being served quickly enough, you don't need to examine them, at least for the point, until they become the slowest part of your application. The other trick you can do, and this does require a bit more work, is something called replay log profiling. So if you configure your web server or your application in such a way that every single request, and I mean the get content, the post content, whatever coming via cookies, is going to be logged somewhere, you can actually simulate what the user behavior um, was in a production environment by replaying that very detailed log file. And that's one of the most reliable ways of simulating user behavior without actually um, putting any debugging code into production environment. But that does mean that you're going to put some sort of an intercept layer into your, typically the web server is the best place to do it, to log every single parameter of the request. And you literally need to log every single parameter of request. Otherwise, your simulation may not necessarily resemble reality. So how can you pre-identify profiling targets without even using Boomerang? So uh, in Apache, that's as, as simple as taking your log format, which is a uh, Apache configuration setting that allows you to say, what do you want to log into the request, and adding three parameters, DIO, not to be confused with the old metal bend. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the D represents the processing time in milliseconds. So that will tell you how much it actually took to process this request. The I will tell you how big the request itself was. So was there anything more complex in the request? Maybe it was a file upload. So the reason it took so long is because there was all this time that it took to you know, receive the file. And the O is the amount of data that was sent. So maybe the request was slow because you decided to send 10 megabytes of data to the user. It's possible. For those of you not using uh, Apache, and using Nginx, you have the same thing, except the format is a little bit different. It uses log format, uh, lowercase, and uh, with underscore separator. And you have a little bit more uh, verbose uh, settings, byte sent, request length, and the request time, which basically give you the same data, but uh, in the context of Nginx. No, did I skip a slide? No, we're good. So um, one of the things that I promised in the beginning of the request is I was talking about PHP errors. And I made the statement that there are no harmless errors. So here's a little sample of code. I have a function A, which uses a uninitialized variable, which is perfectly fine within PHP context, but it does generate a notice. And then I have function B, which does not uh, do that. Now, in order to make this a purely as pure test as I can be, I only set my error reporting to E error. So I'm ignoring uh, E notices, which is what this is going to trigger. And I'm doing this 100,000 times. So when I execute the first function, it takes a whooping 0.06 seconds, basically statistically irrelevant. I mean, this is 100,000 runs. When I do it without errors, uh, it takes you know, a fifth of the time. But who cares? It's still very, very quick. There is, however, one little problem. I mean. Doing this type of optimization would be firmly in the realm of you know, micro-optimizations, and you don't want to do those. Those are typically a waste of time. But if we modify this a little bit, which is more resembling of a typical production environment, I set my error reporting, so I now get E all and E notice. I don't display errors, because that's bad. But I also log my errors to files, which most production systems do. Now, at this point, I actually had to reduce the number of uh, runs that I'm doing to only 1,000 because I was not patient enough to wait for 100,000 runs to complete. At this point, you can actually see that 100, uh, sorry, 1,000 instances of that error takes 0.15 seconds, which is already noticeable. However, without errors, this takes 0.002. So um, now we're talking about um, you know, a fairly significant difference. So in a production environment, errors start to count. And I've seen a number of large, usually it was legacy applications, that don't pay attention to things like eNotice. And now you have another uh, error mode called eStrict or eDeprecated, which tells you about things that are about to leave PHP as syntax. 
ignoring those can actually be a very noticeable um, source of performance issues in PHP. And if you happen to log your errors into database, well, I wouldn't need a 1,000 runs. Probably about 100 would do in order to make a noticeable difference. So what you want to do is fix your errors. Now, one of the tricks uh, that I like to do, and, and that usually gets all the errors fixed really quickly, is make uh, an PHP error uh, handler and make that error handler treat every single error as fatal. Doesn't matter, you notice, you strict, whatever. It's just gonna exit the application and say error has occurred. That really encourages developers to fix their errors really quickly because no matter how minor the error is, the application breaks. You know, effectively a simulation of a blue screen. So let's talk a little bit about caching bottlenecks. Now, this is one of the things a lot of people don't think about because the reason you're putting a caching system is to make things faster. So why would the caching system slow things down? Well, surprisingly enough, it can. Um, I'm basing my example on some data from memcached, simply because when it comes to caching, most people use memcached. That's sort of the prevalent solution nowadays. So this is a data from the stat command from memcached, which gives you all sorts of statistics from memcache. Now, the first thing you want to take a look at is, uh, am I maxing out the network uh, on my memcache server? So if you take the bytes read plus bytes written and divide it by uptime, what is that throughput? If that throughput is approaching the 10 megabit connection that you happen to be connecting your memcache server to your application server, it's probably the time to upgrade and put a one gigabit uh, network card or, or whatever into that uh, particular machine, because that's what's holding your uh, application back. Now, the other thing you want to take a look at is the R usage divided by the uptime. And that's effectively the CPU usage uh, that memcache is doing. Now, memcache is not doing anything sophisticated. All it is is putting key value pairs into memory. So if that is more than 1%, um, you must be doing something really, really creative. <laughs> Um, the other thing you want to take a look at is the R usage um, user divided by R usage system. And that is the difference between how much time memcache is spending doing various tasks on its own versus how much it's doing in terms of I.O. operations with the CPU. Once again, if this ratio is greater than 0 0.5, chances are uh, you are having lock contention, which means you're trying having multiple requests trying to write or modify the same block, and that's slowing down memcache because it's sitting uh, and trying to resolve locks instead of sending the data back. So that's a very important uh, parameter to send, especially if you have busy servers, because lock contention, it's one of those things that doesn't matter if you have 100 application servers. In fact, the more application servers you have, the slower things become, not faster from a lock contention point of view. It could also be caused by a network overhead, but that's more of a rare scenario it's, uh, because you know, that means that it can't send data to the application uh, server fast enough. Usually it is the lock contention that would cause that ratio to be upset. Now the other thing you want to take a look at is the number of total connections. Now memca memcache connections are pretty quick but they still have an overhead. So if you const every request requires you to talk to memcache, consider using persistent connections, where PHP does not need to open a connection to memcache every single time. The other thing you want to take a look at is a ratio of, of uh, get misses to get hits, meaning how many times you try to fetch something from cache and you get nothing, which is equivalent of a get miss. So if your ratio is greater than 10%, you really need to examine how you're using uh, the caching mechanism because you know, you're caching things that you shouldn't be caching because most of the time the, the data is not in cache. So maybe you're caching data that changes so frequently that you write it and then you have to retrieve it you know, only once or you never end up retrieving and when you try to get it, it's not there. The other ratio I want to take a look at is evictions, meaning how many times memcache has to clear data out of memory versus how many times you write data to memory. Again. You're looking for that magic um, 0.1 or 10% ratio. If it's higher than that, chances are you didn't give memcache enough memory. So the garbage collector inside memcache says, well, I got to clean up some stuff because there's not enough memory for me to write new data. Uh, because that's what memcache is going to do when you uh, basically run out of RAM. It's not going to say no to writing more data. It's simply going to throw something out of memory. So you want to make sure that doesn't happen um, very frequently.
So databases, you know, when it comes to performance, databases usually are the first thing people start with. In our case, that was the last thing that we're getting to. Um, so databases are, you know, truly in many cases can be the big source of bottlenecks simply because if you don't have the right indexes, you can write data into a database initially and it's going to be pretty quick because it's quickly in memory, but as you write more and more data, the database gets exponentially, not progressively, but exponentially slower. So you always want to monitor what's going on with the database. So in MySQL, uh, it means two things. First of all, you always want to log your slow queries. The other thing is that you actually want to define what does a slow query mean. For some strange reason, MySQL says the default timing for a slow query is 10 seconds. Well, if you're going to have a slow query of 10 seconds in a web applications, you have a serious problem. So you definitely want to set this value to one second so that it's a little bit more practical in the context of the application. Because most web applications are going to need more than one query in order to execute the page. So having one take a second is already a little bit concerning. The other nifty thing you can do in MySQL is you can enable this uh, flag called log queries not using indexes. So anytime you fire a query and no index is being used, it's actually going to log that query. And the benefit of that, especially for applications that are just starting, is that you can identify all the queries not using indexes before they become problems and you have so much data that all of a sudden, you know, the, app the application or website just stops because, you know, it's waiting for some data to get processed. Now, MySQL also has some wonderful statistics that I had to use really, really small font and I actually had to truncate it. But the bottom line is they give you something like 300 different data points telling you what's going on with the database at any given point. Suffice to say, if, in order for me to go through those, I'd probably need a full day tutorial and I'd still not be you know, done with all those settings. And if you're using Postgre or any other database, there's many more settings. So if you have problems with the database, um, you know, get a book. <laughs> That's pretty much uh, the solution. Now, when it comes to MySQL, um, there are a couple of resources. There's something called MySQL Performance Blog. It's run by a guy called Peter Zaitsev, and he is a really clever guy who knows the ins and outs uh, of MySQL like the back of his hand. Um, there's also Planet MySQL and Planet Postgres for the few of you using Postgres. I'm one of those people. Um, and there's a lot of people who work with the databases and they frequently enough publish a lot of blogs, materials, you know, various little things they came across to help you improve the performance of the database. Um, and yes, a bit of luck when it comes to database performance never hurts. <laughs> Now, one of the things that you want to watch as you're doing your benchmark test, when I mentioned it a couple of times when we were profiling the web server, is you want to watch your I.O. Now, Linux by default has a wonderful tool called VM Stats. It gives you this information, which is pretty much, I like to call it machine readable. It's not intended for normal humans. I mean, it gives you all the right data, but got to help you if you actually need to understand and make sense of it all. Fortunately, uh, there is an alternate tool. There is a tool called SIDAR, which is based on a library called libstatgrab. And what it does, it basically creates a top-like utility, which organizes a variety of the I.O. and now in a more human-readable fashion. So you can see your CPU load, memory load. You can see how much memory is used, how many processes are running, what's going on in the network interface. Um, you can actually see how many IOPS are happening, like how many reads and writes are happening on disk, and so on. And one of the things that I did a while back, I actually wrapped the libstat grab inside a PHP extension that you can find on Peckle. So you can actually integrate a gathering of statistics right from your PHP application. So if SIDAR, for example, doesn't give you the data that you want, with maybe 30 or 40 lines of PHP code, you can create your own version of it, which could be a web panel telling you the statistics without having to um, you know, execute the CIDR utility on a command line and then pipe the output uh, to the web application. So a handy little tool for doing it. So that's all the slides that I have for you guys. On this website, this is my blog. I'm going to post the slides from this. So if you didn't manage to capture any many of the URLs that I've included, um, you'll be able to download the slides and grab all the URLs from there. Um, we're a little bit over time, but I'm not getting kicked out of the room. So if, if you guys have any questions, fire away. No questions? All right. You, you must really be interested in either Keynote or I then a much better job than I thought in terms of explaining all those topics. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening.